in the past five years, Bitcoin is up 113 percent. Gold is 53 percent. S&P 500 is 52. Dow Jones is 35. If you go back to uh, the year 2000, you know, I think it's not necessarily relevant for you know, people my age, then you would have gained way more buying gold than anything else. And then uh, in the past five years, the S&P 500 and gold are comparable. You know, we, we all look at that and we think about investments. How do we protect our wealth? And, and that is important because that's <laughs> how do I live? But uh, ultimately, if you look at all those different investments that we have that we can do, uh, actually, the only thing that's going to be important to us is if we have our freedom. Because, because the, what did Roosevelt do? He, within one announcement, a month after he was in office, he took all the gold in. By force? Yeah, confiscated yeah. the gold. There was gold confiscation in the United States. Many people don't even know about and this. Nobody but. owned, nobody in the United States was allowed to own gold from 1933 up till 1975. And that was, that was when I was trying to get gold legalized, you know. And that's a long time. So that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, but I think one of the most important metrics to look at is the purchasing power of the dollar. And when you look at that <laughs> and what it used to buy you and now what it buys you, I mean, there's horrible, tragic stories of individuals burying their money or yeah. putting it underneath their couch. And I'm like, you, people don't understand. One of the biggest taxes out there is inflation. It's a hidden tax. Many people don't know about it, but the value of your dollar, of what you worked hard for, is slowly being eviscerated by the government and well, their irresponsible financial policies. Th there was a story where a young couple uh, opened up the floorboards in their attic and found a box that their grandfather, or that this guy's grandfather, had, had hidden away with $50,000 in it. And boy, were they pay, of paper, yep. money. paper money and boy, were they so excited to find fifty thousand dollars. And they're like, wow, little do they realize that it's basically a million dollars if he had properly invested it because the U.S. dollar is not sound. Exactly. And, and, and just seeing this happening, because now I think it's it's kind of quickening. Now, when you go to the grocery store, you see it more and more kind of evident and more and more in your face, not just with egg prices, but that has to deal with a lot of other circumstances and situations. But overall, when you're at the grocery store, when you pay for everything. It's a lot more than Dude, it was before, and that's we, not an accident. We just went to the grocery store, and as we are checking out, the, it was 200 bucks for like one half bag of, it was like cheese, tea, some meat, and some, some hummus, and then we were like, how is this $200? What is it? <laughs> well, it was like $8 for a little thing of hummus. It was, it was $8 for a pack of cheese, and we were like, yeah, we filled up a bag with, you know, some deli meats, some cheese, some dips and some drinks. And they're like eight to ten bucks each. And it doesn't take a genius to, to see all of this because during COVID, they were like, we're going to give you guys a two thousand dollar check. Mm -hmm. But we're going to give you billion dollars more to all the private entities and corporations that we're in business with. And and having that much of money just printed out of thin air, those two thousand dollars were nothing compared to the secret corporate and banking bailouts that were given out to some of the biggest institutions in the world. Their losses were were. were were, were private were 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 public were publicized their profits were privatized this is a this is a system that we're we're dealing with right now that isn't capitalistic this is socialism for the super rich everyone else screw yourself and this is a big notion that i think a lot of leftists need to understand here this is not capitalism this is this is direct elitism socialism for the super rich that are able to get away and do whatever they want while everyone else is being screwed over you know the, the words that they use makes a big difference too because because even here, and I'll do it quite frequently, but I try not to ever refer to inflation as a CPI and prices going up. And Mises, I used to say, well, that's just semantics, just, just you know, qualified or something. But Mises said, no, that's on purpose. Because if the price of such and such went up, that means profits they made too many profits oh labor is going up too fast labor unions did that at the same time if uh, if we concentrate on the inflation is back to the money if you dilute the money supply by printing money uh, that that is the culprit that's the inflation so i try never to talk about the cpi oh it showed right. a lot of inflation last year <laughs> but this is this is a trick many leftists use i see them say something like the economy is not doing poorly. These corporations brought in record profits. And it's like, yes, inflation is at 15 percent. 
So if a corporation brings in, say, 10 billion more dollars and they, they typically bring in 100 billion dollars, it is just rising with inflation. That is to say, the buying power of what they brought in is the same, but the monetary number is bigger. Therefore, it's the corporation's fault for making record profits. <laughs> and that's the trick they use to say, see, capitalism's the problem. These corporations are making record profits while you're suffering. No, yes. the reason you can't buy milk, bread and eggs is because it's six bucks for a carton of eggs right now. And so that means those corporations, their costs have gone up the same. And so their profit percentage is the same, but the number is bigger because of inflation. Yeah, yeah. talking percentages and not in, in finite amounts when you want to talk about profits, that's a good point. Those are the tricks they use to be like, yeah. oh, how did they make 50 billion this year? You know, Ron, you mentioned um, <clears throat> units of account and how our money has lost a form of account in that gold was our, used to be the way you would account for money. And then you said something about social account, a unit of account for social, social units of account. What did you mean by that? Well, I think you have to have a value. Uh, the nihilists have a value. Truth doesn't exist. The other one is there is truth out there. And, uh, and it, it might not be, you might not have the same definition, but in principle, all the way back to before Hammurabi wrote his code, they had an idea and the code uh, would, would define even back then, when it was such a primitive era, they say you should kill people. You should steal from people. And that's a higher law. It's a higher law that was known to all civilizations. And uh, I think that you have to have, have that. But it's a tr truth versus nihilism is a good way to do it. But I, I think it's, it's also a higher law which has been uh, known about and accepted on... Uh, you know, from the beginning of time, from time of Adam and Eve, it's, it implies right and wrong, good and bad. And uh, if you have that, you have no unit of account on social order. So is this like um, social credit score kind of like <laughs> a, hope not. Is, it a, is it like a, a, an aberration of of what we're supposed to think is truth? Like truth is what they tell you it is. As opposed to truth is don't kill people. Don't I, guess it, I guess it could be, but the social credit thing, I, just, I, I don't want to get near that one. I agree. And I wonder if losing touch with our unit of account from the Bible, I was never really raised in that way religiously, but I think that there is value to it. Like that if we lose touch with that, then another form of account will come in the way you account to the state, well, something I, like that. The, I think the woke left have no moral framework. It's just power. And then the traditional Judeo-Christian Judeo values of the United States is a moral framework. So I think that's a big dividing point in the culture war. Those who, and I said this before, uh, Bill Maher is a great example of this. He says he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God, but he holds all of these Christian values, such as the right uh, 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 presumption of innocence, which is rooted in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as the principal example I tend to use. But here's a guy who was raised in a society that held these values to be true. He then says, but I don't believe about him. I don't believe anything about a man in the sky or a resurrection or anything. And that's those stories are totally separate from the moral values of presumption of innocence, for example. And so he grows up, he lives a life and he says, I don't believe those stories, but I'm going to tell you we have to hold these values true. When people then grow up completely outside of that religion, that never even hearing the stories or any of those values, they don't recognize presumption of innocence. What do they recognize? The only thing that matters is how powerful you are and what you can take. Mm -hmm. Very well. I've got a burning question I wanted to ask you at the beginning of the show, Ron, and I'll ask you now. If you had the internet in 1976 before you ran for Congress, would you have started a YouTube channel instead? <laughs> <laughs> I had trouble starting it in 1982 or 1992. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not it. Uh, I think about it in theory and in principle and usage and the practicality and how you get the information out. And my job, I spend most of my time, is trying to understand things. That's why I was fascinated with just the fundamentals of economic policy. If it was to Leonard Reed in the Foundation for Economic Education, to me, this was exciting. And I used to kid myself. I said, boy, I'm sure glad I found these people that agree with me. <laughs> and of course, it was the other way around because it's, it's been there a, a long time. So uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, people, people, uh, you, know, you know, can find a thing. But that to me was the most interesting thing is to search. I think uh, once you discover that you're not going to know 
you know, we might just say we all agree on the general principles. That sounds good, having truth and non-aggression principle. But each one of us would, might apply it a little bit differently because the one thing the conservatives can't do is leap over this and accept, you know, somebody else's personal behavior. And then they want to regulate that. That means they've leaped over uh, uh, too far. And that, that means they have to use force to do that. That's why the idea of aggression has to be very, very definite. You said something at the very beginning of the show about uh, there being no honest people in Washington, D.C. or something <laughs> to that effect. And uh, I wanted to say this right away, but I can think of at least one. I can think of more than one, but to be fair, at least one. And that's Rand Paul who uh, uh, your son, obviously. And then you also mentioned, you know, you had kids in college. And I think that uh, uh, Rand is one of the only politicians that I think is doing a good job that actually uh, is doing right. I, I think they're all far from perfect, but everyone's human. And then there's people like Thomas Massey, who I think is doing a tremendous Ma job. Massey's very good. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, uh, uh, on the current state of Congress. And obviously, I assume you think your son's doing a good job, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, once again, I don't get into the detail of that. Be I've, I've over the uh, years, don't even like using their names. <laughs> One time we had a little rally after they did allow me in the, in, in, in the, uh, at, at the time of the election. They, they, they didn't permit me to speak at the uh, convention. And uh, I, um, so we had our own rally. I think I was, where were we in Florida? Florida, yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a great event. <laughs> well, anyway, it was. And uh, I think I spoke on average about an hour or so. And I did, and the crowd was just great. And I never say, I never say oh, I gave a great speech. I say, the crowd makes your speech. And that made, made all the difference. And so I, uh, I was, uh, you know, just really amazed, you know, at the, at the reception that we got there. So yeah. uh, it, it was huge. It was a stadium. There was multiple stadiums uh, in Florida that, that that particular year as well. And there was multiple shows and multiple people being like, this is a representation of the people that's not being represented by the corporate media. That's not being represented by the political class. And there was so much discontent because finally we had a voice that was being heard, but it was being censored by the media. But it was being downranked everywhere, uh, which was crazy. Well, when I finished that speech, somebody came up to me, and it might have been a friendly reporter or somebody that wasn't c c coming. Matter of fact, it maybe was uh, a criticism. I didn't know it. He, he, a person came up, he says, you know, you talked for over an hour. He says, and, uh, who, who were my opponents? Let's see, that was, uh, was, was Trump. Was, no, I don't think uh, that was Trump. I think that was uh, Romney. Romney, uh, had a, yeah. And, Ging Gingrich. No, but who was the Democrat? Um, that was, uh, 2008. That was, Ob was Obama. Obama? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Obama. Obama. And, Hillary. Yep. and the guy come up and he says, you talked for an hour. He says, you never mentioned either of their names. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to go after your opponents. So I mean, I didn't mention the Republican or the Democrat. So I, I, I put that down on the list. Well, I think it's a distraction <laughs> and I, I never enjoyed it. Even though I have to admit that I've been getting pretty sloppy and Daniel has to put up with it because what I do is there's one person that does upset me, and it happens to be a woman, and that doesn't mean I don't like women. I mean, I'll tell you. Uh, we like and that's Nancy or? Pelosi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we all agree with that. I, I, th I think she's a nihilist. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, a, a narcissist, power-hungry yeah. sociopath. Oh. <laughs> and, and if I could just ask you, throughout all of your years, surrounding by all, all of these horrible people in Congress, <laughs> do you attribute what they're doing because of malice or ignorance? Why do you think they were doing what they were doing? Me, Why do you think they're such let, let uh, me, a cause for battle? Let me just simplify that, Luke. Are they stupid or are they evil? There you yes. go. There, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> what, 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 I, I think that the, the problem that I look at is intellectual and philosophic. I, we, we, we started a conversation with talking about, uh, you know, 1913. And I said, well, even a little earlier. Uh, I think people are influenced by that type of thing. And the control of the scenario, the control of the propaganda uh, is, is the real is the real problem. Now, the individuals, they're sloppy. Uh, they're not well informed. Uh, you know, I had people come up, some de liberal Democrats, when I first went there in the 70s, they'd come up and they say, I, I can't figure 
figure out what you're doing. Why are you boating with this guy over here? And I just sort of laugh because I got a charge out of it. But uh, no, there's, and, and I, I think there's, there, that's where we're making progress. I think people are. That's why I love to see young people uh, talking about these issues. So you and, think that uh, I think most of people don't know how much influence they have because I certainly don't believe some of the things people tell me. About, oh, you did this, and you did that. but if, if people, all you have to do is to have a small, small group. If you have ten people, you don't, you, and, and you're not, you're even denied the information. You'll never know. Well, oh, I, how many people watch your show? We probably got about fifty thousand or yeah, more right now. But but you don't know what that fifty thousand might do in the next ten years. Well, one thing to that's the way things change. Ideas. Right. And I'll say this to you. And one thing I've only start realized, you know, maybe like a year ago, is people tell us when they're watching, they're actually watching with three or four other people. So it says one, but it's actually a family or it's a group of friends who are hanging out. But I'll I'll say this to you, uh, uh, Doctor Paul and and Congressman. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I don't I don't know if I would be here right now if you were not doing what you were doing, you know, throughout your entire career. The things that I started learning online, the speeches that I saw from you had a, had a tremendous influence. And I think Luke, obviously the same thing. He's at your rallies. So you may get started with this one idea. And as you mentioned, you tell the 10 people, those 10 people tell 10 more, those 10 people tell 10 more. And before you know it, 30 years goes by and you're sitting on some dude's podcast who's like, remember that one thing you said about the wrong prescription for war? And you're like, oh, did I did I say that? Like, I had a huge, <laughs> had a huge impact on my view of, of a lot of this stuff, too. So I think, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there right now who hear even this show and we don't even realize. Uh, OK, in- I always in more private conversations when we get into these ta- talks like this, I always want to know more about. You know, where you were, why you changed, what happens. And uh, I don't do it for you to say nice things about me. But what what was it that caught your attention? Uh, mine is a little more, a bit more, more complex. Oh, I, like I narrowed it. down the monetary issue. But do you remember w- oh, what yeah. it was that, that well, got your I, attention? I voted for Obama in 2008. I had seen uh, a lot of things on the Internet. I had a lot of friends. I had I had heard about you. I had seen the revolution stickers and things like that. Um, I think that was around that time. It's, 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 you know, it's been a long time. But I remember, uh, I remember Barack Obama was supposedly going to be the anti-war guy. That the Bush, the Bush era was completely wrong. People were marching through the streets saying he was Hitler. And then I'm, I'm this young kid, and I'm listening to punk rock music. War is bad. War is wrong. Blah, blah, blah. And I agree. I'm like, I don't understand why, why we keep hearing these stories about civilians being killed. I don't understand. And I research it, and I, and I learn about it. And I start to understand the history and I, I read about, you know, Desert Storm and things like that. I was a lot younger. I read about the Cold War. And then I say, I don't trust the government. <laughs> Barack Obama is supposedly going to be hope and change. And I'm young and naive. And people tell me, you got to understand, he's an insurgent candidate. He's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be Hillary. She's, she's, the, she's the establishment. Vote for Obama. And I'm like, wow, is this really, really the, the change? And you know what? One of the first things Obama does when he gets into office is he bombs a village of women and children with a drone strike, or, or, or I think it might have been an airstrike or something like that, under the guise of terrorist hunting. And I was like, okay, well, well that's weird. But but maybe maybe that was from the old administration. Like, I'm going to give him a chance. And then he surged our troops in Afghanistan. And then I just got really jaded and angry and was just like, so they lied to me sounds the to whole me, time. Sounds to me like the war issue was a big issue for you. Yeah, absolutely. No. And yeah. of course, then everything you had been saying about the war was, I started asking myself, why is it that... It's this Republican candidate who is preaching against war, who's still preaching against war, who is has now I, I can see as the track record of actually caring about these issues. And then I started to see the hypocrisy in these other liberal and Democrat voters who told me they opposed the war. But the moment Barack Obama got elected, they stopped caring. And I was like, you lied to me. That put a chip on my shoulder and I got deeply offended and distrustful of these people. And not to mention, I never liked Republicans as it was. So what I ended up seeing was more of. I, I, I've never considered myself like a right-leaning libertarian or a conservative. I remember seeing you give certain speeches where I was like, well, I don't agree with that. But the one thing I always said, and I think the Mises Caucus actually quoted me and they made a little graphic was, I thought to myself, you know, this guy Ron Paul is saying, you know, here's what I believe, but you know what? I think the government should leave you all alone. And I thought to myself, 
well, okay, I can vote for that. He can believe whatever he wants as long as he leaves me alone, right? <laughs> and so that that was a big factor. And you know, I, I would consider myself kind of like a centrist libertarian type, more you know, like more freedom, less less government, a little bit of government. I'm not an anarchist or anything like that. But I think I I think the the Obama being a liar thing, and it was kind <laughs> of like they spat on me. They 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 lied to me. They insulted me, and I just don't trust them. And I I see you consistent. I see, uh, uh, and and I was a, I was a huge Bernie Sanders supporter in 2015 and 16 for a similar reason. He was more what I thought of as the left-wing version of you, anti-war, pro-worker, all these things. Sure enough, that was another lie. He ends up just catering straight to the establishment the moment they tell him to, makes a million bucks selling a book, and then says, you can be a millionaire if you write a book too. And I'm like, <laughs> was all of that a lie too? I, just, I don't, look, I gotta be honest, I just don't like any of these politicians. But, you know, you seem to have retired with grace and dignity and remain consistent on all your positions. Then you, you, your, your son is in there uh, doing great work as well. And I'm like, these, 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 these are the only few politicians I actually think have ever, ever meant it, to be honest. Did, uh, but, did but they ever try to buy you off? Did they ever try to silence you or stop you? No, they always insulted me. They never came to see me. <laughs> you think that if you... No, the lobbyists didn't come. Did they come to our office? <laughs> One time and you kicked them out. <laughs> if, if well, you, I didn't You listened to him first. You listened to him first. <laughs> if you'd become president in 08, 2008, do you think that they would have been like, here's who you're going to bomb next? And if you were like, no, that they would have JFK'd you? Uh, well, that's hard to say. But uh, if if you did more than that, if you really change things uh there'd be a revolution uh that for some reason whether they kill you or what but uh, anybody that supported it, it it would be done it's not going to happen that's why that's why he, we have to expect the collapse to come in a different way nobody's gonna we can't get enough people in congress to pass pass the right law to really change things it's good that we have there and we have a few more now than we did before you know with the recent election but it's uh it would be catastrophic if you really change it if you you can't cho close down the fed the fed has to close themselves down yeah you mentioned auditing the fed at the time it was like 2009 or 10 or 11 or something you're talking about auditing the fed and i kept thinking no repeal the federal reserve act of 1913 repeal it but now what you're saying is that would undercut pull the rug yeah, out well i want to repeal it i've had bills in to repeal it it's just that uh i had i had a, a lot of democrats sign on to auditing the fed and all the republicans but they wouldn't have uh, i wouldn't have gotten five votes to to, to abolish the fed there's a famous well, video. It was, it was a practical, it became but, pragmatic, but it was also, to me, educational because I was, I was surprised we did that. <laughs> why, why, why won't they vote for auditing the Fed? I, I, what's, what's their, are lobbyists coming at them? Are their lives threatened? Uh, well, because there's that money is being distributed secretly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really a, a big privilege. I think that. Uh, well, where was it I read? I think it was $31 trillion they passed out over COVID, but it's off the books. I mean, they don't, they don't go through Congress, yep. you know, to appropriate this money. It, it is, and they don't want that to be revealed. That's why I said the thing they want to protect the most are the international transactions. Yeah. That's it, where they wheel and deal and keep the uh, bank going about international settlements. That's probably do a lot of the wheeling and dealing. And with. the bailouts are secret. A lot of the money is being moved around. No one even knows exactly where it's going, who it's going to. I confronted Ben Bernanke about this issue. The guy tried to steal my microphone from me because I was like, where's the money going to? How how much money are you giving people and this was all the way back in 2011 but but the good news is the market is more powerful than the politicians and that is why Bretton Woods broke down that's why Henry Hazlitt was right all through the 60s were right and the people said it won't work it won't work and finally it didn't work and that's why the same people are saying the dollar is going to get much much weaker and they, it will lose its reserve stand it's a it's a reserve reserve country uh, credentials what do you think is like a, a cogent move forward to try and bring it into a slow landing soft landing as soft as we can you can't do that uh, uh, but because the time has passed the best example to know what we could have done and should have done is 1921, because there was a very serious depression in 21. And I, I guess uh, Hoover was still in, but the Keynesianism hadn't taken over. And they just thought, you didn't bail people out. 
you know, it's bad debt. Liquidate the debt and get it over with. So they did nothing. And after a little over a year, the GDP, I think, went down like 15 percent. And then everybody, you know, had to go back to scratch. And every after that, everything was growth. You know, the markets were growing again. And uh, you could have done that. And you could do it now, but politically it wouldn't be acceptable. So start businesses in the, in the private sector? What? If we were going to do it like a soft landing or something, it would be like by creating productivity, but not waiting for the politicians? Well, that's why the market is important. I think that uh, you could, you know, if you took all of the dumb economic things that Biden has done, especially in energy, blowing up pipelines, <laughs> you know, doing all that nonsense and more regulation. If you remove that, that would be helpful. That would increase productivity and lower prices. But, uh, but the, the debt is too big. The debt is going to haunt us and uh, people worry, rightfully so, that, that this, the debt will be liquidated uh, and uh, they, they are going to default. But the default comes because the debt is shrinking right now because of the money is worth so little. Yeah. And they, they, they can't quit doing that. You know, they even talk about, you know, raising interest rates right now each day. If they go, if they say one word to hint that, well, interest rates are going to go up a little bit. You know, the market's got out a trillion dollars. It's just crazy. All so right. it's, it's beyond repair. Thanks for watching this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And become a member over at TimCast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.